I'm gonna be like really annoying. Can you guys hear me if I don't use this? Yeah. Okay, wait, then I'm gonna keep using this for the recording so that everybody on YouTube can, I can go viral. Uh, the second reason you guys are going to hate me, uh, I know in the event description I said that I wasn't going to make anybody get up on stage, but then I lied so that you would all come. So the thing I didn't lie about, though, is I'm not going to make anybody be funny. I'm not going to call anybody out. But uh, for the moment, can everybody please come up on stage? You can bring a coffee, you can bring a donut. This will be uh, easy and, and casual. Let's all try to fit on here. <sighs> cool, great, now you guys give the talk to me. Okay, so um, we, I know it's early, but I am gonna ask you guys to use your imagination for a moment yeah, I have a meme on that, too. Uh, so, could everybody please, for a moment, pretend that you are not a person, but that you are an ant, and that you are an ant on top of a delicious cinnamon graham cracker. And then further imagine uh, that you are ants on top of a delicious cinnamon graham cracker that is suspended in a bowl of milk, which means that each of you is now playing a part to balance this graham cracker. For example, if we all moved over to this side of the graham cracker, it would obviously tip over and then we would drown uh, and die a horrible, terrible death. <laughs> so what's gonna happen is, uh, there are a lot of you, so let's use the space. The graham cracker is uh, as big as these chairs and all the way to these chairs and it includes the stage, so spread out. And I'm gonna say go. And when I say go, everybody needs to start moving. You can't stop moving until I say stop. But you have to be conscious at the same time that the graham cracker needs to stay balanced because if the graham cracker gets unbalanced, then everybody dies. Ready? Go. Cool, that side looks light. That side's looking light. And stop. How did we do? I think we're living, I think we're living. That side is a little light, but that's okay. All right. <laughs> Everybody needs to offset Drew. Okay, second round, ready, go. Mm, now there's like a huge concentration back by the screen. Stop. Uh, like B minus. B minus. You're tilting, but I'll let you live. Okay, so now that you guys have mastered the hang of this, I'm gonna make it slightly more difficult. So, key objective is still to keep the graham cracker balanced, but this time when I say stop, everybody needs to find a partner. In a non-creepy way, just grab somebody that's standing next to you. Uh, that will be your partner uh, when I say stop. But remember, still keep the graham cracker balanced. Go. Oh man, there's like a huge conglomeration like in the center, but all the sides are wobbly. Stop! Everybody find a partner! Does everybody, is there anybody who doesn't have a partner? Does everybody have a partner? Okay, cool. Now I'm going to play so that somebody won't. Ready, go. Same game, same game. No, 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 new partners. Everybody move. Keep the graham cracker balanced. You don't want to be the odd man out. Also, this side is like super light on people. Ants, sorry, ants. And stop. Anybody not have a partner? Oh, sorry. Sorry, pal. That's okay, though. Um, how'd the graham cracker do? It was okay. All right, uh, one more time. Go. Oh, my God, there's no... Stop. Anybody not have a partner? 
Oh, sorry. Loser. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we're done. We're done. Everybody sit down. Thank you. Clap for yourself. Yeah, clap for yourself. No, not yet. Are you not better people now? <laughs> Did anybody happen to notice, like, in your brain, was something different happening between the, the two versions of the game, the version where you didn't have to find a partner and the version where you did. What's, what, what, somebody just shouted out. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, awesome. Great, you nailed it. That was exactly what I wanted to happen, and he's not a plant. But yeah, there is a distinct mindset shift of in the first round, all we're focused on is making sure that the graham cracker is balanced. We're looking out for the group, and that's our primary goal. But the minute I say that we need to find a partner, our focus immediately shifts to not the group, but how can I make sure I don't look stupid and not have a partner, despite the fact that um, we would all die? You know, just because you're looking out for yourself, we still risk the potential of all of us tipping over into that bowl of milk and drowning. So by doing that exercise, you all have essentially mastered improv. So give yourself a round of applause for that. And I will explain what I mean by that. But first, I want to start with a brief story. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Noble. And uh, as Tara said, from 9 to 5, I'm a copywriter at h &L Partners. And from 5.01 to 8.59 AM, I am also a writer, a blogger, an author, an improv performer, and an improv instructor, and probably some other things, too. But I was not, I did not always have so many hats to wear. Uh, there was a time where. I was still in college. I had one more semester left to go, and I had already landed a job as a copywriter at an advertising agency, but a lot of my friends were going to be leaving St. Louis, and I didn't really know what I was going to do. I didn't really have a great way to make adult friends. I didn't have a ton of hobbies or passions, and so I was unsure of what I was going to do as I'd sit at home and play video games with my cat, which I thought ultimately my mom would be upset with me if I just did that. So I was driving home one day and listening to Mark Maron's WTF podcast, and John Favreau was on it, and he was talking about how he had gotten his start uh, in improvisation. There we go. Okay, we got it. So I, I thought back to my past, and in middle school I had done some acting. I'd taken some acting classes, and I had also at one point taken an improv class as well, and I'd always remembered it being fun. And even though I didn't have any big dreams to be an actor, I thought that maybe I should see if anybody in St. Louis was doing improv, that would be a fun thing to try out and maybe a good way to meet some friends. So I got home that day, and I got into my computer, and I Googled St. Louis improv. And the first result that popped up was the improv shop. I clicked that. There were classes forming that Saturday, and they cost $200. And I thought, well, the worst thing that happens is I go to this class on Saturday, I spend $200, everybody there is really weird, I make a fool of myself, and then I go back home and play video games with my cat and I haven't lost anything, <laughs> other than $200. So I signed up for that class and uh, I went, and it was probably the, the best thing that I had ever done, which I know sounds kind of crazy, but it really was life-changing for me. Um, I got to class on the first day, and it already started off on a, a sort of strange foot as our teacher, Kevin, got up in front of the class and told us that improv was his religion. This was the thing he did on the weekends that got him in touch with his spirituality. It gave him guidelines to live by and helped him lead his life. And immediately, my bullshit detector was going off. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a very strange experience. What did I just spend $200 on? And I figured that I would take those comedy lessons and you know use them to be funny, and I would let the new agey woo-woo bullshit part, I would just kind of politely nod my head and leave that at the door. But the more I took this class and the more weeks that I continued to go, uh, eventually I became a convert as well uh, and, and started to see Kevin's point of view of how improv could really beneficially impact your life, which now puts me in the unenviable position of having to prove to you guys that I am not insane. And so I realized that some of you may not even know exactly what improv is. So there is Whose Line Is It Anyway, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, where 
comedians will get a suggestion of a game like props or seen from a hat and the audience will give them a suggestion and then they'll make jokes in that framework. That is one kind of improv called short form improv but what I do is called long form improv and it helps to think of that more as a, an unscripted play. So I work with a team of eight other people that performs a couple times a month and what we do is we'll take a suggestion, single suggestion from the audience and we'll create an entire 25 to 30 minute coherent piece that weaves together characters and themes and plot and occasionally comedy into uh, like a 30 minute complete piece. And that's called long form improv. And I know uh, improv is sort of billed as this idea of comedy without rules, you know, anything goes, anything can happen. And in some senses that is true, but in other senses improv actually has a ton of rules which I guess makes sense, right? Because how could you create with nine other people a spontaneous piece of theater without any sort of rules or structure? So there's, there's actually a lot of rules that kind of help you get into the right mindset and work with other people to create this made up comedic piece. And as I've sort of alluded to, those rules aren't necessarily you know technical rules about comedy. They're really rules that can help you with your creativity, they can help you work better as part of a team, and they really can be taken from improv into your regular life to honestly make you a better person. And I got really into this idea, and I kind of got obsessed with this idea. So about two years ago, I started writing about improv on a blog called I'm Making All This Up, and I wrote there for a while, and then I ended up writing a book called Improv ABC from some of the stuff I had been thinking about on the blog, and now I am uh, standing up here as sort of like a weird cult leader trying to convince you guys to like join this improv thing. So what are some of these rules? The first rule and the one that people probably know best is called yes and. And it's pretty simple. It's, it's yes, which means that you accept the offer that somebody gives to you, and and, which means you build on that offer or add value to it. So if somebody on stage says, hey, you're a purple alien, I say, yes, I accept that. I accept that I'm a purple alien. And then I say, and I build on it. I somehow add value to that idea. So I would say, yes, I'm a purple alien, and I'm here to kill all the humans. And then we're off to the races. We have a, a scene started from that simple act of saying, yes, and. Obviously, the other option is that I say something like, uh, no, I'm your brother, Tom. But that doesn't really get us anywhere. When I say that, that makes my scene partner feel bad for saying the thing about the alien. It makes them feel stupid and look stupid. And it doesn't really get us anywhere because now we're stuck in a scene where we're squabbling about how one of us is insane. Either I'm a purple alien or I'm his brother, which makes him insane. So which is it? It's not as fun as the idea of, I actually am an alien and I'm gonna come kill all the humans. And I'm sure you've experienced this in your normal life as well. You've probably been in some sort of brainstorm situation where you throw out an idea and somebody else says no to that idea, you know, maybe it's out of budget, maybe the client would never approve it, maybe it's not in, in line with the brand, so somebody's like, no, that'll not work. And then the person who said it is probably quiet the rest of the brainstorm, they feel bad about what they contributed, and, and we kind of lose that branch of the tree. If instead we just said yes to that idea, if we accepted it, even if it was kind of crazy and we know it's never gonna work and it's never gonna get improved, if we say yes to that idea and then we and it by trying to build on it in such a way that we do make it a little less crazy, we do make it a little less palatable, we do bring it back inside the brand standards, maybe we come up with something that we wouldn't have ever come up with otherwise. So the second rule is listening. And I guess really that should be like the zeroth rule because if you're not listening, then you're not, you don't know what you're supposed to yes and. If I'm on stage with somebody and I'm like in my head about, oh, is my shirt too wrinkled? Should I have ironed it? Or what am I gonna eat for dinner tonight when I get home? Or, hmm, is that girl gonna ever text me back? And then somebody says, you're a purple alien, and I'm not listening to that, then I don't know what I'm supposed to say yes and to. When I'm not present and in the moment, I can't meaningfully contribute to what's going on between me and my scene partner. And this is something that I constantly struggle with on stage and in person as well. I mean, it's so easy to be out to dinner with a couple friends and then you just check Facebook and then you're on your phone for five minutes or you know, your partner's talking to you and you know, you're thinking about, oh, I had a bad day at work or oh, I have so much to do or oh, like, what's, what am I gonna do this weekend? 
and you just tune out and you totally miss what somebody's saying. But the thing is that people really love to talk and love to be listened to. I mean, obviously, I am up here hoping that you guys are all listening to me. People really like it when other people give them their full attention. And uh, Austin Kleon, the author of Steal Like an Artist, he has this quote. He says, if you want to be interesting, just be interested. And what that means is you don't need to have like 50 awesome stories to tell somebody. You don't need to have a cool job and a cool car and cool hobbies and a million dollars to be an interesting person. Really, people just want to talk and they want to be listened to. So if you are interested in them, they will think that you are interesting. So the third rule that I'm going to talk about today uh, is trust. And a lot of people think that they can't do improv. Like, oh, I'm not funny, I'm not quick, I'm not witty, so they can't do improv. But that's not what improv is about. It's not about being quick or funny or witty. That happens to be an awesome byproduct, but it's not the point. A lot of improv comes from trust. It comes from the fact that if I say, you're a purple alien, I trust that my scene partner is going to be OK with that. They're going to support that idea. They're going to say yes to that idea. They're going to believe that that's the funniest thing that I could have said in that moment. And that makes it a lot easier for me to say something crazy like, you're a purple alien. And it leads to more wacky, spontaneous, funny scenes because me and my scene partner have a rapport. We trust each other that I'm going to say something, and they're going to say something, and we're going to support each other and trust each other in what we're creating together. And when we do that, then the audience is like, wow, I, I, I didn't expect that to happen, because it's really hard to trust and rely on other people in real life. I mean, I know I have been that person who, in college, was like the guy who did the group project by himself. I was like, yeah, 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 let's meet up. and then. People met up and I was like, great, I'll just write the paper and I'll do the research and, and you guys just do whatever because I didn't trust that anybody else would do as good a job as I would on the paper, which I guess is fine in college, but eventually when you get into the real world, you don't have all the skills to do a project by yourself most of the time. And if you do, you're probably not thinking big enough about your project. I mean, I'm a copywriter, which means I can write, but I'm not an art director, I'm not a video producer, I'm not an audio engineer, I don't know how to get new business and talk to clients or any of that. I have to work with other people who can help me do all of those things so that I can be successful at my key function. If I tried to do everything myself, it would be a disaster. Uh, so it's key that rather than trying to just rely on myself and, and say like, okay, I can just do all this myself, I have to trust other people. There's this interesting economic paper uh, that was like, they recently talked about it on Freakonomics, so you might have heard of it. It's called I Pencil. And the idea is that if I asked any of you guys, if I gave you like a couple weeks to go out and make a pencil, odds are that you couldn't do it. I mean, yes, you kind of understand the basic process. Like, yes, somebody has to chop wood. Somehow we have to get graphite into the pencil. We have to put that metal nub on the end, and then we have to do something with rubber to put the rubber into the metal nub, and, and then paint it white and put a number two on it. But none of us knows how to individually go out and do all of those steps for ourselves. In fact, even the people making the pencils don't understand how to make a pencil. Not one of them could do the whole process by themselves. They have to rely on this machine of people to each do their part and at the end of the day, somehow, a pencil is produced, magically. And that's what trust is all about. We trust that if we do our part to the best of our ability, that the other people who are supposed to do their parts will also do it to the best of their ability. And we don't need to understand the whole process or how it's all going to come together. But when we each trust each other, we end up with something that is greater than we ever could have accomplished on our own. So. I know at the beginning of this, when we were all on stage milling about like ants, I said that if you understood the ant game, then you had mastered improv, and you had really mastered all of these rules. So when you think about it, you know what did we do? So the first thing that happened is you guys said, yes, and to me. I said, it's 8 o'clock, and you guys just sat down, but come up on stage. And you guys said, yes, OK, I'll get up on stage. Then I said, pretend that your aunt's on a graham cracker and a bowl of milk, which is kind of an insane thing to pretend since we're all over the age of 12. Uh, but you guys went with me. You said yes and to that idea, and you pretended to be ants. Then you listened, not just as I explained the instructions to the game, 
but you listen to each other with your bodies as you milled about the stage trying to figure out how you could offset other people to keep the grand cracker balanced. And then the last thing that you did is that you trusted one another. Obviously, no single one of us could balance on the graham cracker ourselves, but we trust that if one of us goes left, somebody else is going to go right, and when I yelled stop, that the graham cracker was going to be balanced somehow. So uh, that worked out. Uh, give yourself a round of applause for mastering improv. Uh, so as I was practicing this talk, I was like, okay, I still have time left, so I need to do something. So I decided I would come up not with three, but four. There is a bonus rule <laughs> that I will get into. So on, I, I've been doing improv for about four years now, but about two and a half years in, I had been on a team for about six months, and our coach one day, we were sort of in our heads, and we, we had started a, a steady decline. We, we had been really good, and we were kind of getting in our heads and stressed out and a little overly worried about the rules of improv, and she sat us down and said, okay, can everybody name all of the rules that you know of improv? So we threw out some of the things I covered today, like listening and yes and and trust, and then some more technical rules like uh, define your relationship and you know know your character and, and define the space that you're in, things like that. And we, we listed all these things, and she wrote them on the board, and then she said, okay, great, you're all wrong. And then she flipped the whiteboard and wrote this. She wrote, never fucking bail. And she said, that's the only rule of improv that you need to know. That really encompasses all of the rules that you guys are super stressed out about. You don't fucking bail on your scene partner, you yes and them. You don't bail on their ideas because you say yes to those ideas. You never fucking bail on somebody because you're present. You listen to them, you listen to what you're saying. You're not thinking about what you're gonna do after the show and what's in your head and, and all those things. And you don't fucking bail on them on stage because you trust one another. You know, that's the literal definition of not bailing on somebody, you trust them. So, you know, this one, these, these three simple words really encompass all of the rules of improv in a, in a simple way. But it's just, it's, it's more than that. It's more than just improv. You know, if you wanna be more creative, you know, you don't fucking bail on ideas and your teammates. If you wanna be more collaborative, you don't fucking bail. If you want to be a better person or a better, partner or a better friend or a better roommate or a better anything, uh, just remember, never fucking bail. Thanks. <laughs>